Well, welcome everybody. I'm Mary Caldor. I'm Professor of Global Governance here at the London School of Economics. And I'm very happy to welcome you to the Kapuscinski Lecture, which is a European Union and a UNDP lecture. And we're very, very lucky to have Lord Mallet Brown as our speaker. Actually, many of you may know who he is. He was a very fine administrator of UNDP. He was for a very short while Deputy Secretary General, which he had a big influence on UN reform. And then he came to England, became a peer, became a minister. And what I wanted to tell you is that for some reason, every time he comes to the LSC, I'm the person who is the chair. The first time he came, which was about 10 years ago, when he was still UNDP administrator, I think I was actually standing in for Magnat Desai. And I thought, oh, I thought, a boring UN official. And then to my complete amazement, Mark made a wonderful speech. And I, I had to eat my words totally. And I was quite amazed and hooked on hearing Mark. So we'll have a chance to do that. But before we do, I'm very happy to welcome... Um, Christine Dalby from the EU office here in London and she's going to say a little bit about the lecture. Lord Malik Brown, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honour and a pleasure for me to be here at the New Theatre for the Kapuczynski Development Lecture. The Kapuczynski Development Lecture is a joint initiative of the European Commission and the United Nations Development Programme. It is delivered with academic institutions across the EU, and today we are lucky enough to be here in the London School of Economics. Since 2009, there have been 44 of these high-level lectures where top global thinkers reflect on the pressing development issues of the day. More than 7,500 students have attended the lectures till now. Why Kapuczynski? Well, the lectures are named in honor of Richard Kapuczynski, the Polish journalist and writer who died in 2007. He wrote extensively about the developing world, particularly Africa. The lecture series bears his name in recognition of his work in bringing these issues to the forefront of journalism and literature. It's easy to forget in these times of austerity, which tend to turn our gaze inwards, but the EU is the world's major aid donor, providing half of all development aid when the European Commission and Member States programs are taken together. This makes the EU a major player in the development arena. The European Commissioner for Development, Andres Pibals, has said that the development is not only a moral imperative, but also a strategic imperative for the future. We live in a world where we are all interconnected and where challenges are global climate change, security, migration, and trade. Today, there cannot be a stable, healthy, secure, and prosperous environment in Europe if there is no peace, stability, and prosperity in developing countries. In less than three years, we will hit the 2015 deadline to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. In order to speed up the achievement of these objectives, the EU decided in 2011 to improve the impact and effectiveness of its development assistance. In the future, the EU should target these countries, those countries in greatest need where support can have a demonstrable effect in reducing poverty. It should focus on human rights and the rule of law and growth for development. This focus will help countries improve their own situation and give them the tools to embed that improvement so they do not return to poverty in the future due to poor governance. We will also work on improving the effectiveness of our delivery. If the international community has already done much to help reduce poverty, this scourge still persists in many parts of the world, and it will unfortunately continue to do so after 2015. So we have started thinking about post-2015 development framework and have recently had a public consultation to debate the options and scenarios. The uh, post-2015 framework must be based on a shared understanding with the poorest countries and their populations about 
what the global goals should be and how they can be achieved, taking into account national differences. We hope to be making a policy announcement in the next few weeks. April 2013 will see the launch of the fourth edition of the Europe Uh, European Report on Development. This report will draw lessons from the Millennium Development Goals, consider the changing context and future challenges, and analyze opportunities for international and EU collective action in post-2015. So, to tonight, the theme of the lecture is Heroic Achievement or Folly, What Would Kapuczynski Make of Development Today? Not an easy question, but I'm sure that if anyone can cope to address it, it is Lord Malik Brown, one of the UK's and probably the world's leading experts in development policy. The lecture is being web-streamed, which I hope will open up these important issues to a global audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those warm words, and Mary, thank you for your introduction. I'm going to speak about Kapuscinski and development, but I hope that won't stop you when we get to the question and answer at the end, talk, allowing us to sort of talk about the Millennium Development Goals in 2015. I sort of wanted to talk about them in the lecture, but decided that old Kapuscinski up there would be sneering down at the idea that development could be reduced to a series of goals. I didn't quite have the the courage to do it at any length in the speech itself, but forced me to afterwards, if if you will. Um, Mary, thank you. It's it's always great to be back here. And one day, I hope I'm going to impress enough professors that someone else introduces me. (laughs) But I I tell Mary, it's really because we're a fan club of two. So... um, (laughs) And one day we'll come to one of these lectures and it'll just be you and me, the students who have all gone. Not quite yet. I, I've, I've always, I have to say, personally been, been fascinated by uh, Kapuscinski. He, he showed his readers in Africa or Iran, um, which he lifted free of the statistics or official public relations its re- leaders uh, revealed and showed instead their uh, Canton hypocrisy as well as in journalistically brilliant terms, their little vanities. Uh, But it was was his view the unvarnished one of the clear-sighted journalist, or was it as much a commentary on his own Poland? Um, Whatever it was, it was helped by a dose of inventiveness that went uh, beyond the bounds of journalism and which uh, he's been criticised for uh, in, in latter years. He exposed an Africa to his readers in which he punctured, as I said, the pretensions and follies of rulers and officials while showing an intense emotional identification with the continent's then underdogs, its people. So in this lecture, I'll ask whether uh, Ricek, as he was known to friends, would see the current state of Africa as a further triumph of the elites he exquisitely skewered or the redemptive emergence of a new and more participatory and juster continent. I think in many ways he'd be pleased by the Africa he saw today. Some of his most vivid lines describe the poor around the world and particularly in that continent. Um, And of course, although poverty remains, um, even as he died in 2007, Africa was already starting its upward growth trajectory, pulling up incomes across the continent in 2012 reports by the World Bank, the IMF, the uh, private investment banks, and a little publication who just 12 years ago named Africa the hopeless continent, The Economist, have reported on and prophesied now about the African dawn, and it's a sort of standing joke amongst those of us who are old economist journalists that you know, this is probably Africa's, cause, Africa's problems uh, to be now applauded by that magazine. Um, <laughs> it's luck may turn, but Economic growth has averaged 6% over the last decade, greater than that enjoyed by India uh, over, say, the 1995 to 2005 period. The IMF predicts that 10 of the 20 countries with the highest projected compounded annual growth rates over the next five years will be from sub-Saharan Africa. Now, of course, 
much of this is actually down to, to natural resources uh, and their development. But nevertheless, the region is going to grow by you know, a remarkable amount, 5.3% uh, in this year alone. And you know, we've seen some striking adjustments to figures. Ghana's 2010 GDP revision uh, added 13 billion uh, to its GDP through um, an IMF-driven uh, recalculation, and it shows that you know actually you know there are still difficulties with a lot of African economic statistics. But I think what can't be denied is the general direction uh, is very much of upwards at the moment, um, and. You know, trade figures, which are in many cases easier um, to, to, to measure, um, show that exchange between Africa and the rest of the world tripled uh, over the last decade or so for which we have measurement. Uh, finally, much of the promise of the newly independent states that Kapuscinski visited is now finally being realized. One of the first countries he went to was Ghana, uh, a country that has obviously seen extraordinary changes over just the last 10 years. His own trip came, first trip came at a time of boundless post-independence optimism. He describes at length his meetings with Kofi Bako in 1958, the first Minister of Education and Information in Nkrumah's government. Bako declares, only 30% of people of Ghana can read and write. We want to abolish illiteracy within 15 years. But only a few years after he'd expressed this sentiment, Ghana was thrown into turmoil and in the following period suffered coups and economic decline. Uh, one of the few beneficial side effects was that many Ghanaians went abroad, most notably my old boss, Kofi Annan. But between 2013 and 17, Ghana, a country of 23 million people, is expected to grow at 7.5% a year. And that education minister would be proud if he was still around to know that in 2010 the adult literacy rate was 67% and its youth literacy rate even higher. It's a country that President Obama and others have, have described as a model uh, for the continent. And now many of the estimated 800,000 Ghanaians abroad are starting to go home and take part in this economic revival. It's one of the 23 African countries that have uh, reached the way these things are measured, sort of middle-income status. A recent article in The Guardian told the story of Julian Apuni, who, returning after 20 years of working for Lloyd's in the UK to work for Fidelity Bank in Accra to help capitalize on the growth of small and medium-sized businesses. And, and of course, the phenomenon of, of, of exciting economic return and of fall in global property is, 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 is you know, a wide one with the Millennium, the millennium Development Goals have, have, have followed, and it's not, as I say, peculiar to Africa alone. Extreme poverty, measured as under $1.25 a day, has fallen globally from 43% in 1990 to 22% in 2008, and is expected to fall to 14% in 2015, uh, according to the World Bank. And, you know, it is, you know, worth reflecting just for a moment that when the MDGs were first proposed and, you know, I was one of those who both wrote and helped propose them, they were widely thought to be much too ambitious and aspirational to be taken seriously. And there's still a very good sort of academic living to be made and journalistic living to be made uh, to in, in rubbishing uh, the progress that has been achieved. There are remain more than a handful of skeptics, but the halving poverty target was achieved five years early, uh, and not just because of progress in China. Um, the clean water target also met five years early. But in Africa, the trend is possibly the most surprising of all. A recent commentator contrasted the notably despondent analysis of Africa in 1997 of two of those skeptics, William Easterly and Ross Levine, who reported that the typical African mother had only a 30% chance of seeing her children survive until the age of five, uh, with the fact that Africa has recently witnessed now uh, falls in child mortality 
faster than those recorded anywhere else, now obviously uh, from a worse base. In the five years to 2010, Senegal has cut its under five mortality from 12.1% to 7.2%, and Rwanda and Kenya did almost as well. Yet, despite this progress, and I think if Kapuscinski was here, he would at this point raise his hand and insist that this good news be interrupted for a moment uh, and that we be reminded that a core of the very poor remain, and increasingly they'll be found in an arc of weak and fragile states, pure Kapuscinski reporting territory, if ever the war were, because these are the poor that he as a war journalist would have been most familiar with, a report by Homi Karas, now the lead author of the post-2015 high-level panel meeting on the MDGs, of which David Cameron is one of the co-chairs and which is meeting today in Monrovia, Liberia, together with uh, and Andrew Rogerson, a former colleague of mine from the World Bank. Together they predict that income stagnation and high fertility rates in fragile low-income countries uh, alongside um, the when, when compared with what's happening in the big, uh, more stable countries uh, such as China, India, um, and the other dynamic middle-income countries, mean that by 2025, out of the 560 million people living in absolute poverty, only 100 million will be in those stable middle-income countries like China. The vast majority will be in uh, poor, unstable countries, and the vast majority of those will be in Africa. Uh, Claire Melamed of the ODI makes the point that MDG gains have not been evenly distributed. Indeed, progress against MDG targets can often mask not just significant inequalities between countries, but within countries as well. Um, and you know, sometimes that progress is because of uh, success in just a couple of countries. I mentioned clean water. Well, that's largely because of progress in, in China and India, and indeed sub-Saharan Africa remains uh, off track. But you know, a, a bigger point that she makes is that you know, even within uh, countries which are doing well, uh, you see time after time that the bottom set of households get left progressively uh, further behind. In Brazil, 74% of households in the bottom 10% by income are of African descent. In Vietnam, only 7% of ethnic minority households have access to improved sanitation, uh, while for other groups it's dramatically higher. In Nigeria, the southwest region has childhood mortality rates of 32 per thousand live, live births, while the northwest region, which always perennially feels that it's you know, underserved by uh, what they view as Christian-led governments uh, out of Abuja, has 139 deaths per thousand live births. And, and so I can go on with similar uh, examples from Kenya and, and elsewhere. The UK Parliament's International Development Committee reports that the relative nature of the MDGs had this unintended consequence of exacerbating uh, inequality. And I, I know it very well because you know, I've seen in countries like Rwanda, not through any malice, but in the effort to sort of meet the goals, achieve the scorecard, you go after the easiest targets. The people who are on 90 cents a day to lift them above $1.25 a day. Those who are reachable from urban centers in terms of reaching them with additional health care. And you have this sort of last mile problem of, of, of groups uh, who are left behind. And I think it's one reason why in the next generation of MDGs we have to introduce this concept of getting to zero, uh, getting to the last hardcore examples of, uh, of uh, cases of, of, of poverty uh, in nations and, and between nations. Um, and, you know, I, 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 th I think the, the related thing about that is, is, is how far to pursue inequality. Again, something that Kapuscinski, reform-minded though he was, uh, the old Polish socialist still, uh, I, I think would have had interesting uh, views are Kevin Watkins, who at, uh, just at the end of my time at UNDP became the editor of, of our annual uh, Human Development Report, observes that in India, if you go back 15 years, there were just two 
dollar billionaires in India. Now there are 46. Uh, the 176 billion total net worth of the billionaire community in the country has climbed from about 1% of GDP to 12%. He goes on to say that's enough to eliminate absolute poverty in India twice over, with enough left over to double spending on the co- country's shockingly underfinanced public health system. But, you know, when I went, and, and then he concludes by pointing out that, that Asia's Gini coefficient, the most widely used measure of inequality, as I don't have to tell an LSE audience, has increased from 39 to 46. But you know, when one then goes back and looks at the Gini coefficient in the United States, for example, one realizes that the periods of economic growth which have led to the sharpest reduction in poverty have more often than not also been accompanied by periods of extreme inequality as capital formation occurs and is subsequently used for reinvestment in uh, growth and jobs. So uh, I think Kapuscinski, like me, struggles with what is the fair and just way to to, to look at the relationship between uh, inequality and poverty. Um, He certainly, though, would have been delighted by Watkins' comparison of the uh, and Barney's home uh, in India, which overlooks the Baikula uh, district of, of, of Mumbai, which has six million slum dwellers. So you have the richest house in the world uh, overlooking one of the biggest uh, slums. Uh, and so, inevitably, tackling this issue of income inequality is not going to go away. Uh, it's, I doubt, reducible to a goal in the MDGs, and indeed I can imagine parts of the MDG constituency who might be you know, very alienated uh, were it to be done. But it is impossible to imagine zero poverty in a world with the existing levels of inequality that we see growing up uh, today. And so Kapuscinski, just to take stock, might, you know, while sort of seeing this economic picture as mixed, uh, progress in terms of incomes and poverty reduction, but a little uncertain about the implications for uh, social order and political cohesion of this rising inequality, would also, I think, warn us that despite all the positive news about Africa, uh, the threats that he saw and reported on, coups and conflict, are not gone uh, from the continent. Recent events in Mali, the Central African Republic, the DRC and Sudan seem to confirm uh, a durable, sad stereotype of a continent prone to violence. But even that uh, has to be taken with a large pinch of salt. Uh, Scott Strauss, a professor at the University of Wisconsin, is only one who is pointing out that that according to the Uppsala Armed Conflict Data Program, that wars in the 2000s are substantially down from their peak in the early 90s. Uh, and you know, if one counts an up, even if one counts an uptick, he wrote during the past two years, there are about one third fewer wars in sub-Saharan Africa uh, in this period compared to the early to mid 90s. But nevertheless, he concludes these recent wars signal clouds gathering. And according to him, and I think Mary's own work would be along the same lines of saying, you know, today's wars are typically smaller. Uh, They often involve, as we've seen, small insurgencies of factionalized rebels on the peripheries of states. They also play out very differently. They exhibit cross-border dimensions, and rather than drawing funding from big external states, they depend on illicit trade, banditry, and other international terrorist networks, he he says. Um, And adds, consider two violence over vital resources, such as land, water, and pasture. Now... You know, I think all of this, when added with climate change, rapidly growing urbanization, and other changes that increase the pressure on vital but often scarce resources, lead this professor to conclude, and I I don't disagree with him, that we can only expect to see uh, more violence. But on the other side of the ledger, Africa has increasingly democratic government. Uh, admittedly, only one, well, uh, to start, I mean, what, only one African state now, Eritrea, doesn't bother to hold elections of some kind. Uh, the Mo Ibrahim Index, a quantitative measure of good government, shows a decline of 5% in African political participation since 
2007. And as countries have turned to multi-party elections, so too has the risk of violence during these electoral campaigns increased. And I'm sure one bellwether will be the forthcoming Kenyan elections in early March. But we've just seen the astonishing success of the Ghanaian elections, another close finish where both sides respected the outcome. But, you know, for every Ghana, there's an Equatorial Guinea where President Teodoro Obiang was elected, quote, unquote, with 95% of the vote, and his party won 99% of the seats in Parliament in a country where an estimated 75% of the population live on less than $700 a year, when if it was equally divided amongst them all, they'd have a per capita income of $35,000 because Equatorial Guinea, because of its resources, is the country, continent's richest country. Which brings us, of course, to what uh, Rizek would have, uh, I think, really had a lot to say about, which is that the scramble for African resources is so evidently on. Only five of Africa's 54 countries are not either producing or looking for oil or gas. This resource wealth may fuel, I fear, further inequality and hence uh, also internal discord. Uh, it also may drive into state conflict as resource discoveries uh, lie on, often on the borders of territories whose ownership has never previously been disputed, uh, but which now suddenly is the source of, uh, of, of, of potential major dispute because of the oil lying underneath it. Um, and, you know, so I think, just for a moment, returning to Equatorial Guinea, which is the most galling example of the sort of extravagant elite uh, that this new wealth can furnish, uh, but it's not the only one. Um, although I do think that actually uh, Obiang would have been a more severe subject for uh, Kapuscinski's writing uh, than his famous book about the Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. Um, I didn't... Um, I, I, I didn't know uh, Haile Selassie except, uh, as I say, through those pages, but I do know uh, Teodoro Obiang, and to borrow a phrase, he's no Haile Selassie. Uh, <laughs> but his failings have indeed attracted a literature uh, on corruption because it is uh, so extreme. Um, that, you know, and, and, and so these problems around imperfect democracy, uh, continuing levels of... of, of of potential conflict and indeed actual conflict uh, have, have led to some renewed pessimism in the uh, pages of policy pa pa papers and elsewhere on Africa. Uh, Rick Rowden, a development consultant and advisor to UNCTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, wrote recently in Foreign Policy magazine a myth of Africa's rise and criticized Africa's reliance on a limited range of commodities and extractive industries compared to the much more labor-intensive manufacturing-oriented growth of Asia. Um, but, you know, he's been countered by others who pointed out that, you know, lots of the great economic success stories of today, Brazil, Chile, uh, diamond-rich Botswana, you know, are all heavily dependent on commodity exports. There's uh, nothing to be ashamed of in that, it's how you use the resources uh, that are generated. And that successful stewardship of uh, the wealth that flows uh, from mineral and energy discovery has been picked up by David Cameron, who's argued that successful development needs to be underpinned by what he calls a golden thread of governance-related issues, which he hopes will be integrated into the post 2015 development agenda and given his role as co-chair of the high level panel I, no doubt he'll make a strong case for it um, and, and he's reflecting the argument of quite a few when he says you only get real long term development through aid there's also a golden thread of stable government, lack of corruption, human rights the rule of law, transparent information but of course even in asserting this there's a risk of great offence to countries who think that they can work that out for themselves and don't need a British Prime Minister um, pushing it down their throat. Um, so the post-2015 development goals are very relevant as the high-level panel is 
meeting in Ron Monrovia, and you know, we'll uh, then have a meeting in Indonesia with that under its third co-chair, President Yudhoyono, and then present its findings uh, to the UN Secretary General. But you know, for those delegates assembling to take stock of what's been achieved in the first set of MDGs and what's to come next, they might reflect on how Monrovia itself, Liberia's capital, is changed since Kapuscinski's visit at the beginning of its civil war. In a chapter in his book, The Shadow of the Sun, called The Cooling Hell, Kapuscinski describes driving through the streets of Monrovia in Liberia at the very beginning of the war. Quote, on both sides, sides jutted back, jutted forth the black, charred stumps of burned, demolished houses. Uh, he also goes on about a very large uh, black insect which consumed him. I think he was wandering around his hotel room. Uh, today, Liberia has Africa's first female president, although not now the only one. Uh, there's Joyce Bander in Malawi as well. Uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Uh, relative peace, uh, relative security, and relatively free elections. Its GDP is forecast to rise uh, 7.4% over the next year. So as they sit, as that, the eminent global panel sit down, they should be considering how they might try and do what Ellen, an old colleague from UNDP, uh, has sought to do uh, in Liberia, which is to facilitate an inclusive development um, which addresses not just poverty but inequality, uh, but in a thoughtful and balanced way that does not uh, turn off uh, the engines of growth. And, you know, I suspect they'll conclude that building that kind of world will come from spreading the benefits of education and the hard and soft infrastructure of roads, communications, accountable public institutions, and the rule of law. And, you know, most of all, perhaps they'll come back again to one of the original objectives of the MDGs, investment in, in education. Uh, an investment bank report recently said if we see education as the bedrock of society, then the remarkable aspect of education throughout Africa is the improvement of the last 20 years and the expected growth of the next 30. More often than not, the statistics that speakers give are related to primary education, which is a vital issue. Nevertheless, you know, as important, and perhaps for uh, our knowledge economy, even more important, secondary education has expanded dramatically from one pupil in 10 in 1975 to four out of 10 in a much larger population size by 2005. And by 2020, this particular investment bank estimates that um, between five and nine out of 10 uh, children of secondary school age will be in secondary school by 2020. When Kapuscinski first visited Africa, by contrast, the number of Africans reaching higher professions was shockingly small. Kenya didn't have its first African lawyer until 1956, a Luo who had to wash dishes in the UK to pay for his education. In northern Rhodesia, now Zambia, um, only 35 Africans had pursued higher education by 1959. And in Nyasaland, now Malawi, the figure was just 28. The secondary school enrollment rate across Africa in 1960 was just 3%. Shortly before Kapuscinski's death, sub-Saharan Africans' secondary school enrollment rates were equivalent to where Turkey or Mexico had got to by 1975. And while, like there, there are whole issues of quality that need to be addressed uh, behind these quantitative top numbers of enrollment. Nevertheless, if we see what's happened since to Turkey, Mexico, or Indonesia, uh, I think we can hope for similar improvement uh, in the countries of sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, the consequences are a real knock-on in terms of the opportunities it creates for those countries within uh, the global economy. Um, so what would Rizek have made of all of this? As commentator, he could not fail to be impressed by the economic progress. As journalist, his foreign correspondent's heart would beat faster at the prospect of African, the Africans' conflicts still sadly left to cover. As social scientist and political economist, he would worry at the rising tide of inequality that has accompanied falling poverty. 
you would note the social strains of mineral and carbon fuel exploration, of urbanization, and of the commercialization of African farming. As a novelist, which after all in part he was, as uh, his, his, his biographer and others have subsequently pointed out, he'd be delighted to find that Africa still has its share of strong man leaders with their vanities and peccadilloes. In some, perhaps, he would conclude Africa is on a roll, but he might also conclude that it was not quite yet time to sheathe his pen. Well, thank you for a wonderfully comprehensive uh, view, though I'm not quite sure where you stood, actually, in the end. <laughs> but who would like to ask a question? <coughs> Do you, um, stand up. There are roving mics, and um, please say your name, because it's quite nice to know who people are. There's one right at the top there. Hi, my name is Wilson, uh, next gen student. Um, I would like you to comment on the effect of China's involvement in Africa, both positive and negative side. Thank you. Are we doing one at a time? Or? Let's do one at a time to start with, and then we'll see how the questions go. Well, great question, um, and one which is on so many people's minds. Um, when, the Afri when China's investment push into Africa began, uh, Kofi Annan as UN Secretary General and I as the head of the development side of the UN, rather surprised Western ministers by applauding it. Uh, and we did it because uh, we looked at uh, the competitive <coughs> impact on the West as being really important. There was nothing worse if you ran multilateral agencies and were close to African leaderships than to see the kind of rather patronizing uh, presumptions that went into Western aid delivery. You know, we'll give you health and education, but we won't give you roads because the last roads weren't properly maintained. And we're not going to give you power because it's just too complicated to uh, organize the, the bidding process and it's too expensive, all the rest of it. So, you know, there were massive investment gaps in assistance to Africa that China both filled and spurred others to do better on. So I think, you know, you have to start by saying that. Um, and, you know, the second thing is that, you know, in a sense, uh, to note that, that Chinese aid is geopolitical and strategic and it's about securing uh, assets it wants in, in Africa is uh, not necessarily to condemn it more than others who have helped Africa. Um, so I think, you know, I put those facts on one side of the ledger or but, you know, against it, there are issues and problems in the quality of Chinese support to the African development, the much debated term, you know, terms of many of these infrastructure investments, the uh, requirement that, that, that resources and other things are committed as guarantee uh, payments, the real nature of the terms, which are not, you know, as soft as they sometimes appear. And, and perhaps most critically, uh, the uh, fact that not just on the Chinese infra aid infrastructure projects themselves, but in lots of related sectors, the extensive use of Chinese labor uh, versus African labor and creating jobs for Africans. And I say it goes much wider now than just you know, having Chinese construction workers. You look at, for example, the retail sector in, in, in Africa, and you know, an awful lot of that is being taken over by an emergence of small uh, Chinese stores, which are supplying themselves with textiles uh, and other goods from China. So the impact is not just the undermining of, uh, of an African um, uh, sort of retail sector, it's undermining the manufacturing that lies behind that as well. So while I you know, don't feel qualified to net, net it out, you know, what I'd say is there are some very positive aspects of it, uh, but also some negative ones, and that what China needs to do is be a more open uh, investor and donor and engage 
with African leaders and with other investors and donors in a much more transparent debate about best practice and the way to do this in a way which enhances African development prospects and doesn't have unintended consequences of, of undermining uh, the economic self-sufficiency of countries. Okay, I saw several questions. Gentlemen over there. First of all, I would like to thank you for your excellent presentation, but the continuation of uh, my question is, can China's involvement in Africa delay the devo uh, democratic governance issues in Africa because China can readily provide the what the dictators need in order to stay in power. Not many people discuss this aspect of China's involvement in Africa, but mostly on natural resource and business issues. So my concern is the governance issues. Can China delay Africa's democratization? Thank you. Yeah. Look, it's an incredibly important question, and I'd say that you, know, you might also apply the same issue to a kind of buccaneering class of mining operators and, and energy developers from many other parts of the world too. I mean, you've, you've, you know, who, who again go in where there is an investment opportunity and don't uh, feel any requirement to, to weigh the governance implications. But where I think there's, where I see some hope is, you know, actually being quite engaged in some of this myself uh, in, in, in Africa in my sort of day job uh, post-government. Post uh, what I see is the, you know, both the Chinese government itself, when it's a Chinese government entity that's, you know, putting an investment or an aid program into Africa, and you know, usually through one of its China development banks, or the major oil companies like CNOC, you know, are as fastidious as Western companies about ensuring there is no corruption or facilitation payments in what they do because they realize if they get a reputation for inappropriate in investment where people have been paid off, that threatens the long-term legitimacy of that investment. You know, I think one of the biggest things which is starting to change the corruption climate uh, is that you know, if you're doing a mar an energy development or a mine, you have this long lead time of five or ten years before you see a return on your investment. And then you need to control that asset for another 40 years to, to get your you know, full re return on your investment. So if you've made a 50-year investment uh, with your profits at the back end of it, you have to make sure that it will weather changes of regime and government in the country where you're operating. So this is a huge incentive to do it properly and transparently in a way which enjoys uh, the support of the communities where you're operating and of the governing class and, 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 and everything else. So, you know, for me it's less China versus the West on the commercial side particularly than it is the long-term operator who's developing these assets as a long-term investment versus the more speculative people, which actually tend to be, in the Chinese case, not mainland firms, but firms from Hong Kong, uh, and of which London has also its more than its fair share of, of mine operators who are only going in to prove that there is oil or, or gold there, and then sell on the asset. And the real corruption, as I see it, is around the people who are just in for that kind of quick development and then sell on the asset. And that, that is a much more important uh, criteria for looking at who's making inappropriate payments than whether you're Chinese or British or American. Um, and having said that, I don't mean that all the, the ones who go in for you know, early in stage investment are crooks. That's not what I mean at all. But you know, those who are willing to pay corrupt payments are significantly concentrated in that group of, of investors. Okay, the person right at the back with the red scarf. I'll ta I now have about four, so I will take three this time. 
Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Heider from Bain and Company. Um, you gave some very good examples of developments and, and progress which have been made, and on the other hand, you gave some cautions about things which are still going wrong. Um, overall, would you agree with the message that this time in history, both on a global level and in Africa, is better than any time before, let's say 50 years before, 100 years before, 500 years before? And does that mean that there is 99% or 90 or whatever percent chance that we can say 50 years from now or 100 years from now or 500 years from now, we will again be better off than we are today? Thank you. Okay. And then uh, the lady just there, with just where you are. There we are. You. Yes. My name is Suzanne Long. Um, Several of the Millennium Development Goals are concerned with the development and equality of women. To what extent is this happening in Africa? And is this where one hopes the future will lie? Okay. And um, what about this lady down here with the grey scarf? Don't worry, other people, because we have got time for more questions. Hi, I'm Kerry. Thanks very much for an excellent talk. Um, My question is related uh, to the the lady's question uh, about gender and equality. To what extent do you think revisions or developments of the development goals themselves need to focus on how we go about better measuring impact? I'm thinking about the sort of household surveys that are typically done to measure absolute poverty and whether those really reveal uh, inequalities within households um, uh, do they really pick up on um, the development of women? Okay, great. That's three questions. I'm going to add one, which is, to what extent is there a link between the achievements that you mentioned and the Millennium Development Goals, where they just announced and these other things were happening? Um, I don't know why I like having you chairing my session. <laughs> um, <Sorry. laughs> um, the... Um, Look, on, on the better off point, you know, the, the, if one's talking about you know, indicators of life expectancy, health, access to education, you know, the last half century has been the most dramatic revolution in human outcomes that the world has ever seen. Uh, and you know, it, 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 it sort of frustrates me deeply, um, not, not here at an audience like the LSE, but you know, how, how widely not understood that is, uh, that we have gone through... I mean, I, I was just talking to a TV maker lately, trying to make, it, make a series called The World's Best Kept Secret, uh, which is the extraordinary development progress of the last 50 years. And, you know, I, I, I struggled to un, you know, with why it is that this explosive increase in the access to education, the, you know... 30-year jumps in, in life expectancy rates, the you know, extraordinary transformation in, in poverty and incomes at other parts of, uh, of life, the, you know, when you measure it in terms of purchasing power, the even greater jumps that have been made. You know, why is it that there's this sort of deep-grained pessimism which won't acknowledge this um, and, and, and which continues to want to see the world or large parts of it in this you know, lumpen state of, uh, of, of, of inescapable poverty. And I think, you know, I, I just think it's plain wrong um, that, that it's not what, what it is out there. But will it, you know, is it, are we going to go better and better? Well, I think it's, you know, a little bit like some of the arguments about uh, innovation, you know, do we go on reinventing at the same rate? And not necessarily. I mean, I think you know the, hist- the w- history of the world is a step, you know, a step up and then plateaus. And you know, I, I, I suspect that issues of uh, environmental resource limits, environmental change, uh, a lot of other factors are going to pile in to mean that it will be very unlikely that we can go on sustaining these sharp increases in progress. And you know, some of the other things will be unintended consequences of our success, dealing with an aging population with rising health care costs, etc., etc. So we, we may start to flatten out, but if we do, it makes uh, the questions being raised in the later questions even more important, 
Because if we do start to flatten out, then how income is distributed and how benefits are distributed is going to become even more important because some kind of great global down, global trickle down isn't going to do it. And so I, I think you know, inequalities within the households and between genders you know, are, are going to be critical. Now, you know, strangely, while I'm going to combat Mary on her, her, her view that the MDGs um, uh, are a sideshow, I, I, it wasn't a view, it was no, a question. A question. <laughs> uh, I gave the answer. The, the, um, you know, actually, in terms of the changed status of women in Africa, you know, I do think you know, it's been tackled by two levels. One is you know, an awful lot of development, Western development agencies and NGOs and others you know, really sort of driving at this issue and, 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 and sort of opening the mind of communities to the fact that women do not have to be in this second-class condition, that, um, uh, you know, there are other places in the world where they are equal. Uh, and, you know, and I think that's been critical, but it's had the impact it's had because it's been combined with changes in the political and social economy of African countries. Um, you know, first, much greater female entry into the formal workforce. Second, a move away from agriculture towards more urban occupations. And thirdly, you know, a continuingly quite dominant role of women in the unofficial commercial sector, the market sector, if you like, which has actually had a huge impetus because that sector is also growing and becoming uh, more significant. So actually, you know, now, as I see it, um, there are a growing number of women in very significant roles in government and business across the continent. Uh, the voice of women uh, in civil society is stronger than it's ever been before. So, you know, for me, there's a very clear direction of travel here, and I do think, and it, you know, coming back therefore to the, what goes on in the family, you know, if there is a if if, if, if if there is a problem, it may be less the simple men woman vision, and it may be that in large households, what happens to the more marginal children who've lost a parent or both parents from, say, HIV/AIDS, or whose parents, you know, are migrant workers, or, or, or many of the other kind of phenomenon which are still part of the African family condition in large parts of the continent, and who are definitely still in a very marginalized status. And it comes back to why some of us, in thinking about the MDGs, which is a big global instrument, not in itself directly relevant to the household, uh, this concept of zero is so important. This idea that nobody must be left behind is key because you know, we've got to get away from measuring success of just getting the person on 90 cents to a dollar 25 and measure success as getting everybody to the dollar 25 and, and to less, you know, less by, to other measures as well which are not reduced to an income one. But then to Mary's question about the, um, the, the MDGs, you know, it's a funny thing because um, the, the, when those of us who are involved in, in, in pulling these MDGs out of other um, previous international conferences and putting them into something that could be used in Kofi Annan's report to the Millennium Assem General Assembly, the largest gathering of world leaders that had ever occurred at that point uh, in 2000. The, you know, we, we didn't really have a great sense of the centrality they would subsequently have in, in, in development debates. Mm -hmm. And yet, myself particularly, having worked in different development institutions, you know, was determined, if we could, to have some simple, universally agreed measures of what was development success. And, you know, they had an extraordinary effect, way beyond what we could have anticipated. Because, one, they have allowed a dialogue to form between recipient countries and donors around a very transparent set of benchmarks. And uh, they have led to mobilization 
a very large amounts of additional money. So that, you know, I would say particularly health would be nothing like it is today if it hadn't been for the MDGs. Um, you know, I think income growth less ev evidently tieable uh, to the MDGs. I think that is the broader economic takeoff of better policies of what's happened in China and India and other places. Uh, but health and to a lesser extent education, you know, of the dramatic progress is very much around the prioritizing of funding and support to these areas and the decision by developing country leaderships that this too is what they want to be measured by, by their friends abroad as well as their citizens at home. And actually, I can't resist a comment. I mean, I do think they provided an instrument for local civil society groups, NGOs. I mean, and I've seen that in yeah. Sierra Leone, for example, where they've mobilized meetings around yeah. explaining the Millennium Development Goals or something. So that's on your side. More questions? Yes, you just here. And then the lady behind. Um, my name is Shannon Green. I'm an A-level student. And I was just um, wondering, in terms of international development, there's quite a lot of criticism that, um, or international aid, rather, for African development, there's criticism that aid creates a dependency for African nations on their aid and that it um, leads them into a development crisis. I was wondering what your comments were on that. Well, and I'll, then take, sorry, yeah, yeah. I'll take the lady behind you there. Yeah, that's the right one. Hello, my name is Solen. Um, I have two questions. So my first question is about the MDGs, how you think sustainability and climate change will be uh, taken into account more in the MDGs. And uh, my second question is related um, to my colleague. Uh, it's about uh, aid for development. It will, if it will be, um, if it will be um, tackled more on governance issues and maybe related to that. And the lady beside you, because I know she's had her our hand up for a long time. Uh, what are your thoughts on the continuing rise in live birth rates? Did you hear that? I didn't. Well, it, was the, it was the increase in live birth rates. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's three questions. Another three questions. Well, you know, first, I, I mean, the aid dependency one is a very important one to ask, and you know, uh, really important at this stage in your life, you come out on the right side of that answer, because you know, th there's a whole group of curmudgeons who actually have not spent that much time doing development themselves, who love to promote this argument that, that you know, aid creates um, uh, dependency. And, um, you know, and, and it's to completely discount the transformative impact that investment in education and health uh, and in related sectors has created in, you know, so many countries. Um, and, you know, it's not to say that there aren't countries who have access to their own capital formation who don't need it. China did not grow the way it has through large injections of foreign aid. It's always been pretty nominal in terms of the, the, the country's overall development. Um, but you know, African countries, many you know, had no such access to early capital formation and have used aid uh, to build up their human capital of education and health, uh, which you know, is now giving them a, a real opportunity to leapfrog uh, into the global economy. But I think you, you, you've got to, in a sense, look at aid through two steps. Step one is, in a globalized world where we all are cheek by jowl in terms of immigration pressures, um, migration, migrant labor, uh, where we buy and sell uh, the goods we, we, we make and grow, uh, how we communicate with each other in this sort of shrunk universe. That with all, all that going on, um, uh, that that um, the idea, the idea that as taxpayers, you know, our tax should be solely limited uh, to stuff within the boundaries of Britain alone, uh, or 
uh, internationally to our defense and our foreign office strikes me as you know, a willful neglect of our global citizenship. You know, I think every country, wealthy country, has an obligation to pay a significant but nevertheless overall modest amount to the development of poorer countries. And I think that's as important an issue of global solidarity as you know, the tax we, our grandparents paid 100 years ago uh, for the development of welfare services for the poor of the UK was. So I think there's an absolutely overriding sort of moral argument. The second step to the argument, though, is how do you do it effectively? And here, obviously, you know, if a country becomes permanently dependent on huge amounts of foreign aid, is unable to build its own tax base or, to, you know, become, feels disincentivized to do so because of all this foreign aid coming in, then you have a problem. But, you know, in truth, you know, the world is now full of countries which have graduated from aid, the countries of Southeast Asia, uh, increasingly India, um, you know, the, many countries in Latin America, uh, a number of countries in Africa. And the trajectory is clear. You know, as they grow and their economy grows, the support to their basic services, their ability to create the jobs and growth, can be met from their own resources. So it's a kind of healthy, upfront investment in a country's development and at the latter stages it's much more technical assistance about how to run a tax system or how to manage a school system than it is big capital. So I, I think there's a pretty healthy uh, story to tell actually. Um, no, I've just now, I can't read my own notes on the, uh, the, the second the, the climate, sorry, sustainability and climate change. I mean these have got to be folded into the next generation of Millennium Development Goals. I mean, it is absolutely self-evident, I think, that you know, if the deterioration of an environment that we're presently seeing continues, a lot of the gains in a region like Africa will be undermined. If suddenly we're growing our wheat in Canada and Russia, it's not great news for Africa. And um, so there are you know, massive issues of protecting rainforests, protecting local habitats, addressing climate change, which can't be left out. You know, you can't address income poverty while present, pretending that the global natural environment is a neutral factor in that. We have to conserve it. The stewardship of it is critical uh, to our collective well-being, and that needs to get built into, uh, in, 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 into the goals. On, on the governance point, I mean, I think that the point I made in the talk that, you know, actually the concentration of poor people by 2025 is going to be overwhelmingly in countries look, which look as though they may be poorly governed and have weak state institutions brings one right to that, that, you know, that has to be addressed. But, but it is, you know, it's one of the most difficult bits of development. I mean, when I took over UNDP, didn't have a governance program. By the time I left, uh, seven years later, it was the biggest program we had because I felt that if you had accountable governance uh, with the related things of rule of law, etc., you know, this was the biggest assurance that the poor were going to get a fair say in the allocation of resources in their society. But actually, tr taking that perfectly decent liberal concept and turning it into programs that build good governance and institutions remains one of the hardest, most challenging things to do in development because it's often considered intrusive, uh, rather patronizing, uh, and something that outsiders don't always, are not always felt to have a legitimate uh, view about, hence David Cameron's troubles when he talks about a golden thread as, as, as part of the MDGs, and then hence to the rise in life birth rates. I mean, it's a revolution in itself um, that so many more kids are surviving early childhood, but it does, of course, then have a knock-on uh, consequence, which is that you've got to have the supporting health, education, and then later jobs to kind of make sure that you're not uh, saving them at the start of life, only to uh, subject them to a life of disappointment, of stunting, of you know, all the other things which threaten a child as it you know, is no longer a baby but moves uh, 
through early childhood into adolescence. So you've got to view uh, the support as, you know, not declaring victory because those rates are right, but declaring victory as you take out the other vulnerabilities in that individual's life cycle, which, you know, the next one of which, and which is a hugely unresolved problem in the world, is nutritional quality and therefore, therefore stunting. Okay, the gentleman down here, and then there's one right at the back, and the lady, these two first, and then the one right at the back who's had his hand up for ages. <coughs> down here, blue shirt. It could be a somewhat gloomy question, but is there anything that can be done to get uh, Zaire kind of on the road towards uh, improvement? And it does seem to be sort of perennially stuck in in the morass and then the lady just here with the black shirt um, thank you very much uh, my name is Annie de Lois from London International Mother United Nations I've, I'm actually quite interested in listening a little bit more about your point of view on, on aid because for example um, I'm not against aid at all I mean I come from Dominican Republic we have Haiti and well Dominican Republic itself needs a lot of aid and depends on aid but you know I was the, the, my main issue is what happens with aid sometimes so it, it doesn't tend to achieve its main objective let's say looking at just one minimal example Dominican Republic donated a university Christophe, Henry Christophe to Haiti recently one year ago nothing has been done the entire university is in, in the northern part of the country and it's not working it's the same one I mean I worked for the after the earthquake as well, and I myself witness as well what tends to happen with the aid. It tends to be sometimes it is even sold to the people, to the victims themselves, by the police, by the government officials. It tends to be extremely slow. So I know even though this is not the intention of the aid, and perhaps it might make some positive effects in the long term, perhaps it is not being doing what it should be done in 100%. And so basically, if you could expand on that, and the other, my other question would be, when you were actually in the UNDP, <coughs> I would like to listen a little bit more about what types of mechanisms did you use as a, as a chair to uh, improve the, you know, transparency and work towards accountability, uh, because it would be quite interesting to, to listen a little bit more about that. Thank you. And then the gentleman up there at the back. Yes, hi, my name's uh, Jonah. I study uh, international development. My question was, um, I, I love Kapuscinski and uh, his writings, uh, you know, the sort of long-form style that he had. What do you think he would say about the 24-hour uh, news media we have today and how that affects development, specifically the focus on um, our lack of our lack of action in certain conflicts as opposed to others, let's say Libya versus Syria, where similar things were slash are happening. Um, why do we choose, why does 24-hour media make us, or, or why do we do certain things and not others, basically? Good All right, well, good questions. I mean, first on the DRC, um, you know, to link the first and the last question, the problem with the DRC is the 24-hour news cycle hasn't found where it is yet. Uh, maybe they... Um, you know, uh, and um, you know, every now and again, there's you know, a film crew arrives in the Kivus and finds there's still a war on, and then goes again. And you know, it, it, to the extent that media is the tail that wags the dog, um, um, you know, the DRC is this example of you know the world's great forgotten conflict. Um, uh, you know, it is the worst, remains to this day, the currently worst conflict in Africa in terms of loss of life, both directly from violence, but also from you know, poverty and displacement and everything else. I mean, it's just a disaster. And, um, um, you know, it, it, it remains also this sort of political vacuum at the heart of the continent with powerful neighbors in search of land and resources surrounding it on all its borders so you know it's, it, 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 it's a story of great frustration and 
you know, it'd be hard for anybody to rule that it doesn't have, you know, committed great leadership. And, you know, I, I think in a way it, it goes also to the point about Haiti. Uh, and, you know, it's why, as I've said in, earlier, I mean, you know, there is this focus on governance and institutions as the critical way to go because, you know, DRC really sends nothing from Kinshasa, the capital, out to Goma. Uh, there's no resources. It's just de minimis. And, um, you know, there's all very little capacity in the government. Um, and, you know, this similar sort of broken-backed politics leading to zero government capability is what you have in Haiti as well. So, you know, it's not to say that the aid check on its own can fix a problem. It can't without sort of local leadership and ownership. And, um, you know, but you know, equally, if, certainly if you take Haiti, you know, I think there is a sense in which that, you know, global citizenship obligation I was talking about earlier, you know, is necessary to keep people at least you know, fed and sheltered. Um, you know, they don't deserve the governments they get in a way. And, you know, I don't think we can afford to have a situation where, you know, populations get no help at all because their governments are lousy. What I think we can reasonably say is that you're not going to get the investment in long-term development, such as a university, until you've sorted yourselves out because, you know, there is you know, that is pushing on a piece of string. The resources don't, don't come. So I think, you know, there's, if you like, a kind of safety net level of humanitarian assistance, uh, which, you know, is a, an obligation on us to try and provide the populations. But the, 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 the option of choice is when, it's re when a country is ready for subsequent uh, development investment. And it's tragically, it would be hard to argue that the Congo DRC currently currently is. Um, on, on the um, issue of tr accountability and transparency at UNDP, I mean, I think the first thing to say, uh, which is sort of not, it seems, sounds as though, you know, sounds a strange thing to say, is public institutions like UNDP or Britain's DFID or the World Bank struggle with an almost impossible dilemma because they are stewards of public money. So we have to have the most rigorous kind of accountability to make sure that that money is well spent. You know, I brought hard extra evaluators and audit people and those what because we were working in ever more difficult environments. But at the same time, the very nature of the development bet is about as high risk an investment as you can possibly conceive of. Uh, I mean, at the most extreme, you might say, the reason you have to put development money into health and education in very poor places is because private money would never be so dumb to go there. Um, the risk is too high. And, you know, this is the dilemma that the politicians who run <coughs> aid ministries just never get, that you've got actually to have the courage to tell your public opinion to tell the editor of the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph um, and whatever the, their Dominican Republic equivalent is, um, that, you know, actually um, successful development includes quite a lot of failures. And the reason it includes failures is if you're not failing, you're not taking enough risk. You're never going to reach that very bottom last mile of people you'll never reach the very poorest because your anxiety not to fail will make you concentrate on the people who are nearer cities or you know, nearer the $1.25 a day. To take the risk and go for that very bottom of the pyramid means that projects will fail because the institution surroundings will be so weak. There will be corruption in the environment. But, you know, and, and I remember they reorganized USAID uh, the U.S. Development Agency under President Obama's first term and put it under the direction of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and who I have known for some time. And 
she made this launch and I was asked to stand up and ask the first question and uh, she explained this gleaming new USA ID and how rigorous and scientific it was going to be about its aid uh, contributions in future and you know and I said to her but what's going to happen Madam Secretary when you fail and then went on to say what I've just said to you that it's actually a good thing to fail and she gave me this glinty eye and said we will never fail (laughs) <laughs> and I knew, and, and I understood why she said it, because she had a Senate and, you know, shortly after that, a Republican-controlled House, which would just trample all over her for failure. You know, and you see what Diffid has to put up with, you know, page after page in the right-wing press here about alleged failures. And so, you know, the conservatism of the public sector development establishment is huge. And actually, as a consequence, most of the original innovative things now, I'm sorry to say, happen less out of UN or bilateral development agencies and more nowadays out of private philanthropic foundations whose you know, donors have made their fortunes through risk and failure along the way and, and have none of this hang-up about not being able to admit that occasionally in such a high-risk, difficult business, they get it wrong. Okay. Uh, This has got to be the really last round, because we... um, Let's see. You over here. (laughs) I'll take three. You and you. Oh, no, this lady there, you had your arm up for ages, didn't you? Okay. So we'll just fit in four very quickly, but be quick because we're back coming to an end. Okay. Uh, thanks for your presentation. My name is Xuan from China. Um, I'm just very surprised why um, such resource-rich countries in Africa that are so extremely poor. And if you look at the Middle uh, East countries, they are resource-rich as well, but they are very, doing very well and very rich. Is that because, um, like Middle East countries, they own their oil and they can benefit from it? But in Africa, actually, their resources have been stolen by foreign corporations. Recently, I've watched a documentary. I know Glencore has huge operations in Africa, but they are not paying a single penny of tax there. And uh, the tax evasion done by one corporation actually is equal to the whole of foreign aid poured into Africa. Uh, Now the lady here. Hi, um, I'm Harriet. I'm on MSc Development Studies here. And I was just wondering, um, you know, you talk about introducing the governance program at UNDP, um, but I've been studying things here that have made me question the UN. I just wonder what Kapuscinski might make of the UN today. And then there were two others I said yes to, that gentleman there, and and the one in the green jersey. Oh, dear, and there's one more at the back. (laughs) Hello, Edward Keller from Leeds International. Um, I really enjoyed your book, and uh, I like the way you talked about what you learned in every chapter. And I wondered if you were going to do a second edition. Have you had any new learnings you'd like to add now? (laughs) And here... Hi, my name is Sile. Uh, I'm a student at LSE. Uh, you mentioned uh, post-MDG has to incorporate population in the last mile, and you mentioned that uh, you know, health is an important factor to do that. And, but what do you, what do you think it, um, has to be done uh, to realize the uh, idea of uh, reaching uh, uh, those people at the last end, uh, apart from like, what has been done so far by international community? Thank you. And up there. Hi, my name is Derek. In, I'm an international relation master student, and I just wanted to ask if there's something that can be done more to implement um, the voice of civil society in Africa, especially considering case. Really noticed that, that yeah. Well. Uh, looking for Kony, but at the same time they've said, uh, native have said uh, they don't understand why uh, the civil society association and organization have been in, uh, have not been um, how would I say they haven't been spoken about so I just wanted to know if civil society can be 
broadcasted more in Africa. And then my last question, very mean of me, but I mean to have an extra question because we're coming to the end, was what difference do you think it makes that increasingly development agencies are becoming contracting agencies that, you know, instead of implementing it themselves, they're contracting out? And how does that affect the whole aid process? But you mean com- contracting out to commercial? Or to NGOs, to companies, but actually, you know, if you go to somewhere like DFID, unlike the past when it would have been a huge organisation, it's actually a very small organisation full of advisors and contractors rather than uh, people who execute and implement. And what difference does that make? Yeah. And the same, actually, with UNDP. I mean, it still has its people, but an awful lot of it gets contracted out to NGOs and others. Yeah. Well, let, let, let's start with first. I'm really glad, glad for that China question because it, it sort of punctures those who were not persuaded by me that um, you know this issue of the exploitation of of of, of, of resources in Africa is is, is 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 not China. You know, alone. I know that's not what you asked, but I think you know uh, I, I should have had the Glencore example to hand. But um, you know, but you know, having said that. Uh, and, and, and pointed out that you know companies who are behaving in a way that is not paying tax, which is not paying royalties, you know that there's, there's no geographical monopoly on where such companies come from. The you know other thing to say is that you know Africa's had this mineral wealth for a long time, but actually, and, and a lot of it was sort of broadly known about through earlier surveys by old colonial era oil companies, etc. But, you know, it had not been exploited because the conditions of reasonable stability were not there to enable the long-term financial investment to do it. So, you know, I, I think we've got to see, I mean, you know, the, the examples so far, you know, fall on both sides. Botswana discovered its real diamond wealth after it had secured its independence from Britain. Uh, it through a very constructive partnership with De Beers, you know, where it's always had the whip hand, has grown rich and stable and successful through it. Um, on the other side of the continent, in the uh, west northwest corner of sub-Saharan Africa, you know, a similar endowment of diamonds didn't save Sierra Leone from one of the most brutal civil wars ever around those very same things, diamonds. So <coughs> there's no sort of universal lesson as to which countries successfully exploit this wealth and which don't. And I think you know, governance is a critical variable in trying to get more into the success column. And the other end, you know, there's also the fact that you know, for a lot of the countries, if they don't pass the early tests of good governance and of transparency and fairness in how they award contracts, they may not get further down the road because they may frighten away other investors in an environment where suddenly, you know, actually there is not, you know, the issue is not the amount of oil out there. I mean, five years ago that was an issue, but the energy economics have changed so dramatically that now the investor wants to know that this is oil which is finally really going to get to market. He or she doesn't need to make the speculative investment in a country which is unstable and badly governed. There are other places to invest in oil instead. So, so you know, it, it's going to be a real interesting to see which countries manage to deal with this effectively and which are overwhelmed by it. On the, um, uh, the, 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 the what, what do I think about the UN today? I mean, well, clearly its leadership is not as good as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, um, but, you know, apart from you know, an old bugger's complaint that he wishes he was still running it. Um, <laughs> the, um, you know, I, the UN is captured in its permanent, maybe lifelong dilemma that, um, you know, it remains the only universal, only source of universal legitimacy when it comes to, you know, all sorts of actions from the Millennium Development Goals to treaties to goodness knows what to setting standards in human rights to introducing uh, new doctrines such as responsibility to protect. And yet, 
that very universality that comes from its membership of all by all countries is uh, its undoing because it, it it denies it the effective executive action to cut through and get things done because there's always that search for, for, for consensus and you know this is where leadership does in the organization make a difference because you know under my chief Kofi Annan we had probably the best or the second best secretary general there has been the other great candidate for that status being Doug Hammarskjöld the Swede who died in the Congo in the or actually, well, not that he actually died in Zambia, but was on a peace mission in the Congo um, at the time of his death. And, you know, these two men showed how they actually could turn this gridlock of all these nation states to advantage by, it kind of strangely liberated them to pick their way through this and create coalitions and combinations to get change. And you know, they floated above the chaos, but more normal secretary generals are completely captured by it. And um, so, you know, all the other secretary generals have frankly been more secretary and less general. And um, uh, we're, we're in one of those, the, 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 those phases now, a decent man that we have uh, occupying the job. Now, new learning from the book, um, I think it's time for a second edition. Uh, good paperback out there now, though. Um, uh, and, um, you know, yeah, I think the learning continues because, you know, in my case, my post government life has been partly back in the world of consulting, whereas you know from the book, I spent some of my early life, but also, you know, much more on the boards of, of, of the very foundations that I mentioned earlier as being the real source of inventiveness and innovation. Uh, in development and you know and if I did do an extra chapter or an extra new version of the book there'd be a whole chapter on my rice farm in Ghana which I chair and which is my favorite project of all because you know I've taken all the stuff I knew about development where you have to have the right seed and the right water uh, and you need to have access to markets and all the rest but it still never worked because you made all these inputs and then there was always one missing. And now I've teamed up with a couple of guys who, you know, were themselves consultants with a 40-year-old life crisis. So I have a, a Nigerian partner and an Indian partner and we've created this farm which is a kind of social investment in that it's meant to both make a return and for our investors but also to create livelihoods for a very large number of people. Uh, and, you know, it's fantastic because for me it translates all the lessons that I've preached for so long about private-public partnerships into development into a, a real model that works. And it's got only one disadvantage, which is that, as I said, my day job is a consulting business. And just yesterday, in a not untypical incident, I went to see a major client who wasn't using us at the moment. And so I made the pitch about how we'd be able to work out the risk that he was facing in his African investments and uh, we'd be able to tell him everything he needed to know about Russia and we could do some economic analysis for him and all the other things. The end of lunch, he hadn't bought all of that, any of that, but he was pleading with me, could he invest in my rice farm? <laughs> so, um, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of aware that I've learned some lessons, not necessarily the right ones. Now, just quickly on the, the, the civil society um, um, thing and the reaching of the, if you like the last mile because there are two sides of the same issue which is you know, if I was to sort of fast forward what will African governance look like 20 years from now it will look nothing like western governance you know, I think one of the great mistakes we made was to think that, we, that, that Africa would model uh, state centered institutions of the kind that we have within a half mile of this place you know, that there would be great government departments sitting in a central capital which would somehow be delivering services down to the community. You know, African service delivery will come through partnership with civil society. But similarly, African political voice will come from civil society. Civil society is weaving its way into this sort of 
early version of African democracy, it is much more responsible for accountability uh, than, than more formal institutions. It was the Human Rights Commission in Kenya, which was the critical partner of Kofi Annan in negotiating a coalition government and progress after the last Kenyan elections. Time after time across Africa, as the political class is seen as corrupted, living off fat MP salaries, and, and, and just generally in it for office holding and the perks that brings, the political legitimacy and authority is, is, is shifting uh, to civil society, which I think is a huge player. And, and actually, you know, one of those other foundations that I'm so pleased to be on the board of, the Open Society Foundation, which you know, is also a supporter of various LSE activities, um, you know, is actually the biggest funder of civil society and international funder of civil society in, 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 um, in Africa. And so, very, therefore, to, lastly to Mary's point, and just to say that um, I, I don't think it's quite as new a phenomenon as you think, this, 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 you, this contracting out. I mean, I, the UNDP field staff has remained, for example, relatively constant. Uh, and it's always been the intention that you, you'd have partners to do things. But, you know, it differed, what you're looking at it through the lens of, is a particular problem because, you know, it's been given this great exemption by the government to grow its budget to 0.7 of UK GDP. But it's had its staffing levels subjected to the same freeze that the rest of government is subjected to. So it's created this particularly sharp anomaly between, you know, the number of people to manage the program and the size of the program, leading to some really sort of weak management, I, I, I agree at times. But, you know, if you take the more traditional thing of a UNDP or a World Bank, you know, I think it's not really to kind of push away responsibility for this, but you know, a recognition that the staff of UNDP or the World Bank are very expensive a very high cost on top of development programs. So the more you can bring in local NGOs and others with often much greater local knowledge, the more you can bring down the transaction and overhead costs. So, so I think it's in a general quite a good trend, but here it's been taken not, not, not all, I mean, it's a pity that Kapuscinski didn't get to write a book about the UK because I, I think he'd find plenty of slightly anomalous things in how we run ourselves here like that. Well, I want to thank Mark for a wonderful talk and for, you know, the fact that we've gone so over time and I'm sure there would have been more questions just shows how, at how successful it's been and, you know, it's fantastic, him with a cold answering all these questions. I also actually would like very much to thank the audience because I think we had some fantastic questions and I felt... The questions displayed the fact that actually LSE are the students from all over the world that are going to do all the things that Mark hopes will be done in the, in the future. And finally, of course, I'd like very much to thank UNDP and the European Union for making this event possible. So thanks to everybody. So we can all... <laughs>